So I'm known as Mr. Soul from Brothers Grimm Seeds. I am the uh, original breeder of Cinderella 99, and um, I'm very proud of that strain because at that time, there was no such thing as a plant that you could grow indoors that was a true sativa result that didn't stretch too much, take too long to flower, and give you too little yield. But everybody loves that taste and that high from a sativa because it's not that sleepy weed that you get from the indica, okay? So I was out on a mission to create a strain that could have the result of a sativa in the high and the flavor and eliminate that long flowering time and the tall, stretchy nature of a sativa and increase the yield without giving up the potency and the flavor and the type of high. And when Cinderella was done, it took about two years of back crossing to one individual plant that I had called Princess. And there's a whole cubing process I went through, it's called cubing. And if you, any of you get Dope magazine or see that anywhere, it's July now, but in August they're going to have a whole article featuring me describing how Cinderella 99 was created and the cubing process and what that entails and so on. So watch for that to be coming out, and check out our website, brothersgrimseeds.com, two Ms and Grim. And uh, with that, I'll sort of kick off. You guys have the uh, literature that they passed out before the thing that gives a little bit of a bio about my coming out of a nuclear engineering program at RPI and deciding to uh, do this as a sideline until eventually, who would have thought in 1986 when I graduated, uh, that uh, 25 years later, the cannabis was actually the profession that I really went with instead of nuclear engineering. But anyway, so we're here to talk about what we call the F word, feminized seeds, right? And it has a lot of controversy surrounding the subject. Why? Because for a while, feminized seeds were created by an improper technique that led to hermaphrodites and we're gonna talk about why that's not a good thing. I'm going to approach this uh, discussion from the standpoint of I'm talking to people that may have just come to a cocktail tail party, know nothing about marijuana, and so I'm not gonna leave out any important information that I assume you already know, okay? So don't be insulted by it, but I'll start from the very first question. Why do we even want our seeds to be female? And that's another thing about Feminized, that word, I call it the F word, because it has this negative connotation that we did something evil to seeds that would have been male, but we feminized them. And that's not at all what happens. We're just making female seeds. I think that's a softer and more accurate description when we produce our seeds. I've gotten away from calling them feminized, I just call them female seeds. So you can buy our seeds in either a pack of regular seeds that will give you males and females, or you can buy a pack of female seeds that will only give you females. So let me shout out to the audience and get somebody to respond. What's so important about the female cannabis plant that we only want that? No seeds. There's no seeds unless you get pollen on that female, right? But more to the point, if you're growing marijuana, why would you eliminate males and only choose to grow the females. Greater density of medicine. The female is the plant that creates the buds that we smoke. A male doesn't, right? A male produces basically these wispy, thin branches. Some are heavier than others, obviously. But you're only getting flowers that don't look like buds. They're if you ever seen a male flower, it looks like an umbrella that you get in your uh, summer drink uh, on holiday on a beach or something, right? They open up like a canopy, and then these little dangling things called stamen hang down from there, and then the pollen comes out of that, okay? But there's no mass of smokable material that can be created on a male, not even close to a female. So we want female plants because that's the end product you want to sell if you're in the cannabis business and you're either making THC heavy or CBD heavy strains, the female is the plant that gives you the product that you're trying to produce. Now, that's already reason enough to eliminate the males from the room because you only want female product in the end. But what would be wrong with growing a few males in the same room with the females? Seeds. What's wrong with seeds? You lose potency on the flowers. 
That can be uh, true to a point, but even more important, what, uh, how do we buy marijuana? By weight, right? You're buying it by the ounce or the pound or the kilo or whatever denomination uh, units of measurement that you want to use, but it's always a weight. Now, if you have marijuana that has seeds in it, it's heavier than if it didn't, right? Can you smoke the seeds? No. So, having seeds in your marijuana reduces its quality because now you have weight that you're paying for that isn't smokable, right? Right. So, the female will tend to grow bigger buds and grow, grow uh, more resin on those buds in anticipation of some pollen coming from somewhere. Nature is telling that plant to just keep making flowers. Some pollen will come eventually, but it never comes. And that's how you grow seedless marijuana, which is what everybody's goal in growing marijuana is. Um, unless you're a seed business like me, then we're crossing plants and actually purposely making seeds. But that's a whole different subject. So we've established that the female cannabis plant is the desired gender that we want to grow. We don't want males in the room because they would end up pollinating the females and they'd lose the quality, they'd all have seeds in them and it would be ruined, right? What's worse than having a male in the room? A hermaphrodite. A hermaphrodite, right? What's a hermaphrodite? Both male and female. It's a plant that, in this business, starts out looking like a female and then fools you later by starting to make some male flowers and then they pollinate the room. And that's worse than a male because when you have a male, at least you can recognize that it's a male and say, oh, let's get that out of the room. And they give you plenty of warning. You've got two weeks of those flowers forming before they ever let any pollen out. And you can say, whoa, that's a male. Let me pull that out of the room so we have only females in here. A hermaphrodite is like a Trojan horse. Remember what the Trojan horse was? They, they wheeled it into the, behind the gates in the Roman, and then all of a sudden uh, the, the uh, warriors come out at night from the Trojan horse. Well, a hermaphrodite's like that because it fools you into thinking it's a female plant, you're putting it in there with all the rest of the females, and then when it's too late, all of a sudden you, decide, you, you discover that there's pollen coming from somewhere in this room. Oh, damn, there's a plant that made male flowers. So you really, really, really want to avoid hermaphrodites. So now, as I said earlier, so that nobody's lost, we're starting from everybody knows that female cannabis is the gender that you want. Males shouldn't be in the room because they'll make seeds on the females. And hermaphrodites are those evil little bastards that you got to watch out for because they could fool you, right? Do, do you ever, have you ever gotten like a seed or two without any visible hermaphrodites? You just like in, in a large grow in a harvest, you'll find a couple of seeds. What, how do, why does that happen? Well, you got a hermy somewhere. That pollen is coming from somewhere. It might just be like one pollen sac that you missed or something be, like that. Could be, and one pollen sac can take, you know, make a million pollen grains, and you could have a million seeds in the room. Well, that's why it's confusing to me, because I would think if there's a pollen sac, you would find more than just like one or two, two seeds. seeds. Yeah. Well, they don't all ideally land on their targets either, though. It's like, you know, when those tortoises have all the little baby tortoises rushing to the sea. 90% of them got eaten by something in the water before they mature. Same thing with the pollen. There's many places for it to land that isn't going to create a seed. And so if you only have a little in the room, you can get a very few seeds. And you can also have cases where one plant has what they call nanners because the, the uh, male flower can look, uh, the stamen looks kind of like a banana. It's yellow and it's curved and it kind of looks banana-ish. So we, we, Call it a name. I just have a quick question. And maybe uh, that gave you the few seeds. Okay. Uh, so you have, you have a feminized plant, and somehow you screwed up and you stressed it. Yes. And it hermaphrodites on you. Yes. And then it seeds itself. Yeah. What would happen? What's what would happen to that? That You're particular. You're creating more hermaphrodites like that, mm -hmm. and that's the next thing I wanted to talk about. So, what determines whether a, a seed is going to grow into a male or a female, or any organism on this planet where the, there's two genders. You know, some plants are, don't have two genders, it's just, you know, one plant that makes both male and female parts. So, keeping aside that, what makes boys and girls? On a chromosomal level, what's the difference? This one wants to, you want to shout it out, sir? No, I had a question. Okay. <laughs> um, Go ahead. Is it Hermes from, they don't get it from light leaks? From which? Light leaks. You can, and I'm about to, I'm about to break into that, so I'm let sorry. me expand on that. Thank you, I'm about to answer your question. So, 
what, what makes a boy and a girl at the chromosomal level? Have you ever heard that, like when you're in 10th grade biology? Right, X's and Y's, what are they? Chromosomes, right? Cannabis has 10 pairs of chromosomes, and one of those pairs is the sex chromosome. They inherit one of those genes from their mother and one from their father, right? Like we all have. If you're a boy or male in this room, your father contributed to your mother a Y chromosome, and that's why you're a boy. If the sperm that had reached her egg had an X chromosome in it, you'd be a girl, right? So that's what, at a chromosomal level, separates the boys from the girls, okay? So what's a hermaphrodite? It's got both male and female flowers on it, right? For a long time, I did a stupid thing. I'm a smart guy, well-educated, should know better. I made an assumption, and I thought, well, hermaphrodite must be something that has neither XX chromosomes or XY chromosomes, must be something in the middle. So I started to research it a couple of years ago, and I said, huh, it turns out scientists and doctors, they write these research papers and they put them in journals like uh, Nature. And if you go back to the 70s, there was a guy called a Dr. Mohan Ram, R-A-M, and he did some studies with cannabis and changing the gender and how that worked. Here's what he found. If a plant is stressed, like the gentleman was suggesting over there, by changing the light cycles, that's one of the most common ways to find out if the plant has a tendency to react to that stress by restricting its ethylene. That's a hormone, right? Ethylene is a hormone very much analogous to estrogen in human women. And that's what makes them girls and gives them all of the emotions and the body shape that they have and so on. And when we see people nowadays in our modern society where people have kind of come out, uh, much more so than back in the 50s and so in, a, in a more restricted generation, uh, a little before I was born even, um, nowadays people are pretty free about saying, you know, I really feel like I'm a man trapped in a woman's body or vice versa, right? And how do those folks achieve the body uh, image that in their mind they feel represents them? What do they take? Anybody oh, shouted out hormones, right? So my big mistake was assuming that there was some chromosomal difference that defined a hermaphrodite versus a male or a female. As it turns out, in those journals, many doctors and scientists have searched for a combination of chromosomes that were responsible for hermaphrodites. What did they find out? Only in something like one one millionth of all cases of hermaphrodites is there any kind of a chromosomal difference. What's doing this then, right? And when you think about it, it makes sense. Why does it make sense? There wouldn't be so many hermaphrodites in the cannabis world if it depended on some very rare combination of chromosomes that was causing that, would it, right? It would be much more likely that hormones are responsible for hermaphrodites. And what is really, what you're really looking at is a female that has XX chromosomes that defines the fact that it's a female, yet it's reacting to stress by blocking not absorbing, not producing enough ethylene to express its female flowers, and it starts to make male flowers. Now that's a reaction to stress by an organism. In the past, when they started with feminized seeds in the old days, I'm talking about the mid-90s to the early 2000s, and they became popular because people liked the idea that, oh wow, I can grow all females and not have to pick out any males. Problem was, the technology at the time and the understanding of how this works was not understood by those early breeders. Um, and they would stress, as the gentleman to the left said, using light cycle changes and uh, differences. Um, mostly in light cycle is what will mess up the plant. And if it's gonna go hermy, that would be the way to trigger it, okay? So these guys would look at a bunch of females and stress them and see which ones would make pollen, right? And they found that the pollen from those plants that went hermy, if you used it on another female, all the seeds would make females, right? 
Well, the problem was that by stressing plants and finding out which ones would produce pollen, they're actually testing for what? Tends to become a hermaphrodite. Hermaphrodism, right? So what they're doing is breeding more hermaphrodites by finding plants that spontaneously create male flowers under stress. That's not the right way to do it. You should be doing the opposite. You should stress a bunch of plants, find out which ones don't make pollen, and then use hormones to induce flowers on those individuals. Why? Because they don't have any hermaphroditic tendencies to pass on in their genes to the next progeny, right? So what you're gonna end up with is seeds that will only give you females with no hermaphrodites, and certainly no males, no real males. Why? Bingo. So if you have two female organisms and you've hormonally induced one to make flowers and the pollen that comes out of those flowers, if that plant never had a Y chromosome in its makeup to contribute to the pollen, there can't be any in the pollen. So think about this little thought experiment. You imagine a room full of female plants with flowers ready to receive pollen, and a male would, al would allow a cloud of pollen to fill that room. And you know how statistics works? If you have a large enough population, and there's only two choices, like flipping a coin, it's heads or tails, X or Y chromosome, the room is gonna be filled with a fairly equal number of Y chromosome pollen and X chromosome pollen to land on the female flowers, right? In the case of a reversed female, all those pollen grains in the room only carry an X chromosome, so that's all you're gonna get are female seeds from those plants when they do mature. So that's why those early fem seeds produced a lot of hermaphrodites, and I still get people coming to my seed booth and saying, do you have, her do you have uh, female seeds, feminized seeds, I'm trying to get away from that word, so I will often replace it with female. And I'll say, are you asking because you want them or you want to avoid them? <laughs> and it's about a 50-50 shot because many people say that because because I don't want any feminist seeds. I've heard nothing but bad things about that. Okay, well, I understand why they feel that way, and now you do too, because that early experience for about the first decade of feminized seeds being produced, they were being produced in the wrong way, right? So how do you do it right? I'll repeat, search for females that have no hermaphroditic tendencies in the first place, because remember, it's not just the pollen donor plant that you need to worry about. You also have to worry about the other female that you're pollinating, right? Because both parents contribute 50% of the genes to their children, and if either of them has a hermaphroditic tendency, that's gonna be carried on in the next generation. So how do we pick those two females? stress test them, right? So I've had clones that the seed was first germinated back in 1996, and though I have two clones from that period that I still have today, so there's something like over 20 years old, right, 22 years old, and they just continue to be that same organism for all of that time, and I have grown them in very varied situations, outdoors, indoors, different temperatures, different times of the year, and so on and so forth, those two clones have never hermied at all in 20-something years. That's the kind of plant that you want to make feminine seeds from, because it's proven itself as not being hermaphroditic, right? And so when I do all of my crosses now, both parents are vetted. I'll use a Trumpism, an extreme vetting has been used to <laughs> get these two plants to where we are sure we're not gonna be creating hermaphrodites in the next generation. So that's how it's done right, okay? And then it kind of brings a interesting element to, or an advantage, a, a new uh, trick to put in your toolbox as a, as a breeder um, in the sense that when you're creating seeds or ma making a strain of marijuana and you're a breeder like me and you're trying to be very careful about it, there are many things that you're very concerned about in crossing the male and the female together. Remember, we're only interested in the daughters that come out of that union, right? We don't care what the males come out like. We're going to throw them away anyhow. But when you breed two organisms together, 
Back in the day of uh, Gregor Mendel and all of his work, he established a rule that's fairly easy to understand. That it's called like begets like. So if the parents have it, they have the possibility of passing it on to their children, and it's actually great likelihood that if you have a plant that has quality, it will be passed on to the next generation, unless the other parent somehow cancels that out, right? So when you're only interested in the female progeny, and you're using a male and a female together, you're going to get regular seeds, regular meaning that they'll be 50-50 male and female if you grow enough of them, large enough population. And uh, what's the problem with that? Do you have room for all these plants? Here's the problem as a breeder. If like begets like, and you're trying to join these two organisms, <laughs> and you're interested in their female progeny only, how do we know what female traits the male is contributing, right? There are no female characteristics in a male to judge him by, right? Because the male plant is very different from the female. It doesn't have these big buds. It doesn't have all that resin. And you can't tell what female traits are being passed from the male onto the, into this union until you observe the results and you start to evaluate the progeny from that cross. And to be really thorough, the right way to do it is to have many females pollinated by the same male grow out that generation see some sort of common denominator that that particular male has contributed to all of those females, and then you can finally say, aha, so with that male, I get bigger buds, smaller buds, more resin, less resin, but it's not immediately obvious by visual observation of the parent. You need another generation or two before you're gonna be able to say, ah, now I know what that male does to his daughters, right? So, when you talk about female seeds, what's something that like a light bulb goes off in the breeder's head that like, holy cow, this will really save me a lot of time and energy because when you're combining two female plants, you already see all the female traits that each of them are going to be bringing into the union, right? There's no extra work, another generation to grow out, evaluate, try to figure out, scratch your head, what's the common denominator, what does this male contribute? That's a lot of work and a lot of time that goes into something like that to really be sure about what you're doing. So when you make two females come together, you can really much more accurately and, uh, predict what you're going to get in terms of the female progeny, and you're only gonna get females too. So there are all those advantages. And, uh, I've kind of gone through all my notes, and I think I've hit on everything that I could think of. And I'll take some more questions. The gentleman with the band How can you cross two females without a master head? OK. How do you get them to see? Right. So that's great. I did skip that. So one of the most important things is how do you hormonally induce that one female to make male flowers that only have X chromosomes in the pollen, right? Well, stressing is the wrong way to do it. We've already discussed that that'll only find all the hermaphrodites in your female population and then you're gonna start breeding with them and creating even more of a mess, right? So the converse of what I was saying, in other words, if you had a room of let's say 100 female plants and you stressed them and in the end you found 25% of them that hermaphrodited and so on and then the rest didn't you'd pick your best females from the ones that didn't hermy, and then use one of them to be the pollen donor to another plant. And the way that you get it to make male flowers is that you use silver thiosulfate spray on the buds as they're first forming, as soon as you see the first few pistils, until you have maybe even like a little cluster of a half a dozen or a dozen on each bud tip, where they start to look like, have you ever seen flowers when they're first starting to flower and it looks like q-tips forming at the tips of the buds. If you spray with thiosulfate at that point, a week later you'll see those female flowers starting to revert into male flowers. Why is that happening? Right, because we blocked the ethylene from allowing those flowers to express female traits. So what alternative do they have? They go male. 
and then the pollen is yes. Uh, so basically, you find the ones that don't want to turn male on their own, but right. then you chemically Force reduce them. them to exactly. So that you see the huge difference that that makes yes. because in the first case, you've stressed the plant and it's told you what it would do naturally. So without any disruption, it will have the tendency under stressful conditions to create a hermaphrodite, and you want to avoid that. So the two parent plants should be vetted for herma hermaphrodism. So you do that first, and then you find, like I was saying, I have a 22-year-old clones that have never so much as thrown a nanner. Like these are really solidly female plants. And if I were to take one and with silver thiosulfate induce it to create male flowers, only X pollen will come from that. And when it lands on another plant that has also been vetted for anti-hermaphroditism, then we know we're gonna have nothing but female seeds come out of that generation of seeds. There certainly won't be a male because there's no Y chromosome and there won't be any Hermes because neither of the parents had that tendency to start with and wouldn't propagate that into the next generation. So thank you for pointing that out. It's a very important point is like, the right way to do it versus the wrong way to do it involves forcing the flowers to go male versus having a plant that does it naturally. And that was the mistake the pregenitors of femini feminized seeds were, was making. They were making that mistake. Yeah, I think that's why I understand Yeah, it takes a little bit of, uh, like, I did a lot of mind <laughs> juggling over the last couple of years of, you know, sorting out, like, how does this all work? And when you do the research and you really look into what other scientists have done before, the building blocks are already there for understanding this stuff. It's just that we as cannabis people don't tend to be research scientists and you know, for very few of us anyway. And so the stuff is there to learn, it's available online, and you can do the same research I did and find the same results. And then the thing that will really prove it to you is spending time and getting experience doing that like I've done for the last couple of years. I resisted making feminized seeds in the early days of my company. You know, Brothers Grimm has been around since 1997 and we were gone for a period of about 10 years and then reopened the company back in 2015 in Colorado. <clears throat> but I always said I put a lot of pride in the fact that the seeds from my company don't hurt me, right? So the last thing I wanted to do was start playing around with feminizing seeds and end up selling hermaphrodite seeds and then ruin my reputation. So it was with great caution and a lot of double checking and reassurance of myself by testing this stuff out and experiments at home before I was absolutely certain that I could stand up in front of a bunch of people and say, this is the definitive uh, explanation of feminized seeds. Gentleman to the left. So I got a question. Yes, um, please. How, do you, how long do you apply the hormone? That's a good uh, question. I had been doing it from the first day of flowering, spray the plant to the point where you have runoff of the solution running off the leaves and so on. So you've doused the plant with the stuff. Every other day for the first two weeks of flowering, I was doing that and it did produce quite a few male flowers and the only difficulty I found was that if you overdid the amount of spraying, it tended to make the male flowers all be packed tightly together like a female flowers would be. And male flowers need a little bit of space to open up that little umbrella we were talking about earlier. And if you have them all packed together into a bud, very few of them are actually gonna be able to get away from the other ones and open up and let pollen out. So it's kind of tricky. The timing and the amount of STS, we call it, silver thiosulfate, and um, I've talked to some other guys who've been working in this field recently who say, oh no man, you don't have to do it that long. And uh, what I do is, as I was describing to you earlier, when the little buds start to look like Q-tips and you have maybe a dozen little pistols sticking out of any one point, if you spray that flowers with the spray one time and just leave it at that, if you spray it at that point, a week later you'll start seeing male flowers. Two weeks later it'll be open and giving you pollen to pollinate your females and make female seeds. So that's a way that I'm about to start trying. I know my other way works, but it has some points that I'd like to see improved. And if this gentleman's uh, suggestion pans out in my next uh, demonstration, I'll probably talk about the results from that. But it does sound correct to me. 
because uh, before you have any female flowers, if you're just spraying the vegetative parts of the plant, it's not really <coughs> necessary because there are no flowers there to revert that. So, yes, young lady? So when you spray the STS, are you destroying ethylene or are you blocking them from being able to uh, react to it? I wish I knew technically. That's something I'd like to dig in a little deeper and understand whether it's a blockage of the ethylene or a, uh, that would, uh, <clears throat> or whether it's something that's is stopping the plant from producing ethylene or absorbing it. It's okay. one or the other, but yeah. it's one of those things where, <clears throat> well, I know it works. Uh, I don't care which one of those it is, but I, I am curious, and that is something I'd like to look into. Good question. Yes, sir. Uh, is fertilization a cannabis-specific term? Or? No, they've done it with other plants as well. Any dioecious plant uh, should res respond to this treatment. And uh, what exactly is SDS? What, what is that? Term? Silver thiosulfate is the technical term. It's one of those solutions. Have you ever worked with epoxy glue? Anybody? They always offer you the A and the B formulas that then you, only when you're ready to make the glue, mix the two together, and then it's good for some limited period of time. Same thing with silver thiosulfate. You're taking silver nitrate, I believe it is, and don't, don't quote me on that, but there are two components. One is the silver component, the other is the thiosulfate component, and you mix them separately into two solutions that only at the last minute when you're ready to use them do you combine them together and then it has a shelf life that can be extended by refrigeration and so on. But uh, that's the way it's prepared. There's a formula available online of how much of each to mix into the A or the B solution. If anybody emails me at mrsoulbrothersgrimseeds.com, I would be happy to supply you that document that you could then work with it and know that, oh, okay, this, these are the instructions from Mr. Sol and his source that this is the right way to mix the silver thiosulfate together. I'd be happy to share that with anybody who emails me for it. Um, I think that covers that, yeah? Okay. Well, I, I wanted to actually recognize and thank you for your contribution hey, in the industry before it became an industry. But my question for you and your long experiences uh, in regards to hermaphroditic tendencies late in flower, a plant that mm -hmm. tends to throw something left a little yeah. bit too long. Let me use, so use that as a criteria in eliminating females and looking for stable genetics to uh, feminize or to... Yeah. Any hermaphrodism <laughs> should be avoided, but <clears throat> there's a famous strain out there called sour diesel. And many people grow that, and I mean, it's a very popular strain. I was living in New York City for five years and wasn't growing, and any time the guy with the backpack came to our apartment, you know, one of the selections that he offered was always sour diesel. So it's a super popular strain. But when you're growing it, it does, as the gentleman there by the wall said, uh, it throws a few nanners toward that, like, last week of flowering. So it could be considered to have hermaphroditic tendencies, but... There's a caveat to that in this case that many of those male flowers that form at that last week of flowering aren't actually viable pollen, no real viable pollen is coming out of them. And it's so late in the cycle that it doesn't have time to make any seeds anyway, even if that pollen did get on the female plants. Unless you're running a perpetual harvest room and then you're bringing in new plants all the time and then some of those earlier plants are getting pollen from the later plants, then you'd have a problem. But if you just started all the plants in the room from the same time and flowered them through that same cycle, in the last week of flowering, if you had a few male flowers popping up on that sour diesel, it doesn't have time to pollinate another plant and create a seed because you're gonna be harvesting in days. You know? So that's okay if you can live with it, but it's certainly not you know, what I would wanna do in a breeding situation. Yes, sir. Two questions. Yes, First, um, is it possible to reverse a male using a spray or some other method to see what it has and what it may possibly pass on to mm. these females? They do females? respond to reversing. Both sexes do respond to reversing, but you don't get as dramatic of a difference turning a male back into a female. Enough where I would say like, oh, now you've tricked it into showing you what female traits it has. But it's an interesting idea. I can't say I've tested it out. I've just seen plants that I think like, 
I don't know. I'd really rather see the daughters and evaluate them. And, and second if, question. Just real quick. Yep. For the smallest pot size you recommend for a female hunting? Just if, trying to get through picking your favorite. Yeah. I, I usually do um, my smallest pot size is a two gallon pot. And that's enough to grow a plant to maybe a foot and a half tall and start to see some structural uh, differences and be able to choose from those plants on their structure. But certainly you're not going to flower a plant in a two gallon pot because then, you know, you're going to go root bound pretty fast. So I usually go to at least a 10 after the two. And I'm in organic soil feeding with teas. I have an alpaca farm now and I've been using the alpaca manure, which is unique in the sense that most manures need to be composted for some time to make them available as nutrients to the plant, where alpaca uh, manure is immediately available. So I go out and I clean my alpaca pen, and I'll come back with maybe 10 pounds of uh, alpaca manure, and I put it into a mesh bag, tight screen like a, a tea bag, drop that in a 30-gallon reservoir of water that's been set to pH 6.5, and the alpaca manure will raise the pH until you know you start to get too high and then you have to lower it more. But there's a um, great nitrogen source in the alpaca manure, and it's immediately available. So I've been using that as a tea during veg, and when I go into flowering, I use much less of that and much more of bat guano or pho phosphorus sources of other natural types. And I create that tea, which is then used as the watering for my plants that are in organic soil that I mix from maybe 20 different combinations of uh, components that go into it. So that's what I do. And your question on the right. What do you think about super auto? Auto plants confuse the hell out of me because they kind of break the basic tenet that I've always stood on as, uh, gee, what's the great thing about growing marijuana? Well, when you find a really great female, you can trick it into staying alive forever. What's the normal life cycle of a cannabis plant on the planet Earth? One season, right? Because in fall, when they start making flowers, they go into senesis and die. And then it's only their seeds that can then create the next generation in that same plot of land on outdoors in the next season, right? But having indoor lighting and being able to take your favorite female and keep the light cycle long so it always thinks it's summer and just keeps growing vegetatively, it'll never stop. You can, it to me was like a eureka moment as a college student when I read that, I was like, you can do that? Gee, I know, it was like, there was a story of, uh, who was that, Archimedes, right, when he figured out the, the density problem for the king, and so he could tell whether the crown was made out of gold or if it was filled with silver. He ran down the street naked because he jumped out of a bathtub and he's yelling Eureka running through the streets. It was like that moment for me because I realized, that means that once I get a really valuable female, I never have to give it up. I can just keep that clone forever. Now, that's all common knowledge to us today, but when I first learned that, I was like, and the other thing that was a eureka moment for me was the light cycle thing causing, like, what makes marijuana plants turn into buds? You know, I lived in the upstate New York uh, as a child, and if ever I put a seed in the ground, it would grow vegetatively seemingly forever and never make buds, and then frost would come and kill it before it ever did. I was always like, where did those pictures in high times come from? What are those guys doing? You know? And then I read Jorge Cervantes' uh, Indoor Marijuana Cultivation, and I saw... You mean they actually know when the days are shorter and the days are longer? It's just a plant, you know, that's pretty smart. So those two things really got me excited. Now, I, the long wind-up to answer your question about the auto-flowering plants, but if a plant doesn't respond to light cycle and it just automatically flowers no matter how long the lights are on, and that's what an auto plant does, what's that imply when you're growing, right? Let's pretend they're all female seeds, so we don't even have to worry about the fact that once you start this bunch of auto-flowering seeds, you won't have to pick out any males. What's the big downside of that auto-flowering characteristic? Well, one major thing is you could find a really exceptional female and just cry and watch it die, you know, and yes, you might have a good yield of great weed from that female, 
But unless those seeds are so reliable that every time you grow a seed, it's just going to reproduce that same amazing female over and over, you lose the advantage of keeping that special female and propagating only that in a room where you can keep consistent grow that all the plants are identical so they have the same flowering time, they'll, they'll stretch to the same amount, they'll be the same yield, the same quality, same flavor, everything the same. You lose the ability to do that with an auto plant. Second problem I see with auto plants is if you're in the cannabis growing business and your intention is eventually to create marijuana that people want to buy, most of us have certain strains we like, right? Or when you go into the dispensary, you say, oh, I want you know, something I've heard of before. Is there going to be a sour diesel auto? Is there going to be a Cinderella 99 auto? Are all the famous strains that you'd like to find to buy and smoke going to be available in an auto form? Probably not. So the third thing that becomes a problem then is every crop you grow has to start from seed, right? I think it's a funny phenomenon in the seed business that anybody who buys a pack of seeds from me doesn't necessarily ever have to buy them again, right? That's part of the business. I know that, okay, you will now find an amazing female out of this pack of seeds. You can clone forever from that, never need to buy another pack of seeds from me, and I go out of business? No, because there's so many other people who will come and say, I want a pack of seeds too. And so it somehow seems to work out, but Imagine if I were in the auto seed business, every one of my clients would have to come back to me after each harvest and get a fresh charge of seeds to go back into that room and fill it up again, right? Great for business, right? But, per, uh, sorry, uh, auto flowering is a, is a trait that comes from a strain of marijuana. It's called ruderalis, and that trait has been successfully by some companies, I assume, uh, bred into their strains to make them auto-flowering. But the problem with the ruderalis cannabis plant is that the potency for the THC is extremely low, like hemp. And so to get that quality of auto-flowering incorporated with a plant that also produces quality weed that has potency takes some work. And if they're doing that successfully, and if there's some reason in your growing environment that you can't tolerate changing the light cycles and you need plants that will just automatically flower no matter what the light cycle is, then that would be something that would be in some valuable to you, right? I just see very lim limited need for that personally. I don't know. I could be wrong because there's somebody who really needs auto seeds and that's the only right. thing that works for them, you know. Right. Yourself? Are you good? Same way you feel. Yeah, I mean, why, why would you need that? Any other? Yeah. Well, First. Okay. Well, well, you so go. Just to add to that, I think that out of flowers, I haven't grown any myself, but mm -hmm. um, I think that they fill a niche where maybe there are some growers, and, and I know some people that grow that run autos, and what they do is, well, they'll, run, they'll start the auto when they have a certain space that's kind of maturing, right? They'll mm -hmm. transfer from veg over to a flower. But, well, the auto flower is still growing on its own cycle. Mm -hmm. So it can fill that spot in the tent before it starts to steal light from the plants that you just threw into flower. So it, you can get uh, more, I, I guess, uh, or you can supplement your harvest from regular seeds, I would say. I think you could do that with so non-auto. You know, if you have clones that are two, three weeks behind the first group that went in, you could do the same thing, but that doesn't need to be an auto plant because you're talking about bringing it into a flowering room, right? Did you yeah, say that? Yeah. Because now think about it, auto seeds work on the principle that you don't have to make the short light cycle to induce flowering, and therefore you'd never even have to move them into a flowering room. They just start flowering when they're ready, when nature tells them you're old enough now, regardless of the light cycle, it could be 24 hours of light or 18 hours a day or 12 or whatever it is, they're going to start flowering, right? So maybe I have it wrong, I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay so because this is brainstorming there. together like this is what it's all about. You know, we're here to discuss and hash this out and dispel the old wives' tales and rumors and talk pure science and what really is the truth, right? We're after the truth here. So good to hash that out with you. And I'm going to go with the gentleman in the far back there. You, you with the hat, sir. Yeah. Oh, I'm just going to give an example. I actually have an application. Good. I have a greenhouse outdoors. I don't have any blackout curtains. Mm. I call them snacks. 
Yeah. Because they're, I got full, full season plants. Mm -hmm. But you know, kind of just, they're growing over on the side. I don't even pay much attention. They take up a gallon of potting mix. Right. Don't care, just throw some water on them. And how's the... I've a couple that have been, the tops have been pretty nice. Good. Yeah, yeah I was it's, wondering it's like about the quality. Yeah, it's, 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 snaps. it's just snaps. Oh, that's, that's good. Again, people are definitely, there's a couple people who work with. Gentlemen in the middle. Yes, sir. Okay. I live in Oregon, and I happen to grow a few by mistake. Yeah. And a lot of guys in Oregon grow that because they get their product, it's, they're phenomenal. I yeah. mean, I, I, by mistake, I found them. And I bought them and didn't realize. I bought them from a guy from Clones that sells from Rich Monster Group. So when you say, let me go back to make sure I'm following. You did something by accident? What, what did you I do? Bought, I bought... Uh, yeah, auto seeds. Oh, auto seeds. And all of a sudden, I thought, oh, these things are going to turn. Because I planted them real early, and I thought I they didn't catch, and they were going to turn early, and then they were going to try to revert back. Uh -huh. But they didn't. They kept right. flowering. And then I talked to Rick's monster bear, and he said, oh, no, those are auto flowering. No wonder. Oh, yeah. Well, a lot of guys like to do that in Oregon because they get the early crop, the early, early harvest, sure. and the biggest money because everybody else is coming in later. Right. So it's kind of like having a, a, a light depth when you get sure. in early. Okay, so as long as you can get a good quality that people want and, uh, you know, it can fill a niche like several of you have pointed out. It's not the type of plant, though, that I think that you could go into business and say, this is my business model, you know what I mean? Yeah. Gentleman in front. When, uh, when you're keeping a mother plant for 20 years, yeah. are you always going to get the same clones off of it? Does it lose anything over the course that's of life? A, that's great. I'd love to dispel that old wives' tale that you know you get this d genetic drift and taking clones from clones over time will be like taking photocopies of one uh, document and then e over time you notice how the photocopy starts looking thinner and less dense and harder to read. Why? Why does that happen with a photocopy? Errors. Right. You are not getting 100% of all the information transmitted from the first copy to the second, which then causes a degradation when you take the second one and make a photocopy of it, make a third, and so on and so on. There's a diminishing of the resolution. So it's not as dense, uh, densely packed packet of information anymore. But what's happening when you're taking a cutting from a plant and rooting it and then making a fresh new separate plant from that cutting? Is there any loss of resolution in the DNA? No. no. So each time you take a cutting from a plant, you're just taking the same DNA that it had and making it grow separate from the original plant. And now it becomes a plant of its own. What if you... <coughs> kill the original mother that grew from seed and all you have left is a clone of the original plant. Is taking clones from that clone going to cause a problem? No, same reason. You're not getting a diminishing of the resolution of the DNA because that microscopic packet of information that is the recipe for that organism is being carried along uh, faithfully each time. I almost said religiously. <laughs> what about a clone taking too early or too late? Does that affect that? What do you mean by taking it late? Or four weeks into flowering. Oh, you shouldn't be cloning plants that have already started flowering. How about two weeks into flowering? I wouldn't do it when they're in flowering at all. I always clone from a vegetative plant, right? But not that that would change anything. You would just introduce a delay in the growth of that clone because now it has to revert back to veg state from having started flowering, right? So it's kind of silly to do it that way. And the only reason I suspect that somebody does do that is because they have regular seeds, they want to pick out the males, and they bring them all into a flowering room for two weeks. And by two weeks, you're going to see males and females and be able to pull your males out. And like this gentleman may have thought, well, any of the females, I'm going to want to clone from them so I can save that clone as a future clone source once I've tested these plants in the flowering room and I harvest them, if they turn out to be amazing, I'm gonna be happy I still have a copy of that plant to make more of that amazing plant, right? I found in my time as a grower and breeder that most plants will show you which sex they are even before you put them into flowering. If you're observant enough and you're watching all of the branching points, you'll see what I call pre-flowers. You'll see like two pistils coming out of a single calyx and it doesn't go any further, you know, it's just, doesn't become a bud or anything, but it'll show you that it's a female. Of course, I'm doing this, right? What's that? Peace. Peace. 
Well, it's a peacetime. But it also looks like what? Female, a female flower kind of looks like a peace sign. It has that body, the calyx, and the two pistils coming up out of it, right? So what does a male flower look like? Just a Like calyx. a fist, kind of like a fist. And it generally comes up on a little stem and that little fist is sticking up until it finally opens and you have that little umbrella and the stamen hanging down as I was describing earlier, right? So you'll see those things in their early development. You'll see those little pods starting that you'll know that fist looking thing is not a peace sign. And so that's a male plant and you don't need to put it into flowering for two weeks to figure that out. Gentlemen at the back. Uh, so you're saying don't clone when they're in flower at all? Because some of our growers, they like to call them monster top clones and stuff like that. But we've run into problems here and there when you're cloning when they're in flower. So I'm thinking that we're only going to clone when they're, when they're vegging. You should. I mean, when you think about it, what's going to happen? When you put the cutting into a cloning uh, chamber, uh, whatever type of cloning method you use, what light cycle is on that? Vegetative, right? So if you had the plant in flowering, then you took a cutting, and now you're bringing it back to veg, it's going to be confused by the light cycle, first of all, and need to revert from flowering back to veg stalling all that other stuff that's got to be going on because meanwhile <clears throat> you're hoping that the cells in the stem that are sitting in the medium are going to start sprouting roots right mm -hmm. so you're just giving the plant a whole lot of work to do right it's yeah, more had, than necessary successful runs and then when it was like third week of flower when they started taking cuttings from that i noticed that's when we started running into issues the further along into flowering, the more work it's going to have to do to get back to the vegetative state. And give you, and you have to veg those clones for a while to be big enough to flower anyway. So, I'm not quite sure why your boys are doing that in flowering, but they shouldn't probably do that because even if I were to say, well, I grant you by three weeks you're going to start to see the best plants in the room, and you're only going to take your cuttings from the ones that seem to have the most promise. Maybe that's their thinking, right? Yeah. But I don't know if that really would play out over the entire life cycle of the plant that those early indicators that you saw then really lead to it being the choice plant in the room. I've had many times where I thought, oh wow, I really have a stellar individual right here in the fourth week or fifth week. And then by the time harvest came around, it was like, that other one over there, I never would have expected it actually out it surpassed this plant that I thought was the favorite in the room. So I generally recommend that every female that you put in a flowering room, you take a couple of cuttings from it before you put it in there as insurance. Then, you know, by the end of the flowering cycle, you just go back to the clones and say, these ones didn't pan out and these ones did, and I'm only gonna continue to propagate those. Yeah, that makes sense. Gentlemen in front. I don't know the validity of the theory, but the theory that I have heard on taking clones in the first week to two weeks of flower is that it increases the oxones or growth hormones in the plant as they're transitioning, and that that therefore would increase the amount of oxones in the top heads where you're <coughs> taking your clone, and therefore it's more likely to root quickly. I don't know the validity of it. But well, I mean, I have no complaints in the speed at which my cuttings take. Yeah, I cut the veg. Yeah. So if I'm cutting a veg plant and putting that into a rooting medium, and in seven to 10 days, it's rooted, and maybe a few more days for it to have sufficient roots that I would say, okay, now I'm gonna take it out of the cloner and put it into its own pot. I'm only talking about a two weeks period of time maximum from taking the cutting to taking that cutting as a rooted new plant and putting it into its two gallon pot and sending it on its way to be vegetable and flowered. If I were to take my cuttings after a little bit of flowering time and it increased the speed at which the roots formed, how great of an advantage could I get? Realistically speaking, shave a couple days off, even if it were a week, would that matter? It's not enough, you know? That's how I feel. Uh, for your future projects, are you gonna be vetting for hermaphrodites as you go? Like, let's say if you threw out Apollo 19, making that up off the top of my head. Sure, why not? Um, would you be vetting throughout the process, or is it easy enough to take Apollo 19 in this hypothetical situation and then feminize it later? Uh, when you say evaluating it for hermaphrodism, that's the two parents that are gonna come together and create the seeds. Each of those individual females would have to have been observed growing in a variety of situations 
especially stressful like light cycle changes, temperature changes, anything that might stress the plant and test it for a tendency for hermaphroditism. But I would not then grow out the progeny and say, I better check them for hermaph whether they're hermaphrodites or not. I'll assume they won't be, but part of breeding a strain and releasing them to the public involves the intelligent choice of the parents, the creation of the seeds, and then the testing of that batch of seeds by a large population to be sure what the hell it is you're selling to people. Like, if you see the seed packs on our booth uh, at the moment, we're booth number 426. Please come and see us after the uh, demonstration here, but uh, you will see, um, where was I? Shoot. <laughs> um, the packs of seeds that I sell have been either tested by me for a long time personally, or I've released a large number of testers to a wide population of people that then grow at the same time as I'm growing mine at home, and we all kind of compare notes. And with a recent release that I just did called G13 Genius, they were both plants that were well over 20 year old clones that never hermaphrodite in my experience with them and anybody else's that have grown those clones. So when I brought them together, I had no expectation of hermaphroditism and it was obviously very reassuring to have all these other people. What I did was, here's the thing that I lost track of as I was going off on a tangent there, is that for that particular testing, what I did was I thought was an interesting experiment. I said to the online world, you know, the social media, I'm going to give out a hundred packs of this strain for people to test. First hundred people who write in and uh, give me their uh, info on a DM, of course, because I don't want everybody sharing their address with the world, but I had a hundred people take all of those packs and uh, over the past six months they grew and got back to me with their results. They were super positive results and they matched what I had and I knew that I had a consistent strain that if I sell you a pack of seeds, the pack has a picture of the plant on the front and a description on the back that tells you what qualities you should expect in growing notes and hints as to what type of treatment each of these strains prefers. And I wouldn't be able to write any of that if I didn't have the experience of growing them out and vetting them, but it's not so much for hermaphroditism, it's more to give me the information I need to be able to describe it to you. And I think that anybody, any seed company that sells you a pack of seeds that has a picture of the plant and a description of what it's supposed to be like, you should be able to grow those seeds and say, yep, it really looks like the picture and it really performed very much like the description. And anybody who's selling seeds that don't do that, they're what's called a pollen chucker. You know, there's hoping that it'll work out. And one of the biggest issues today with buying seeds where people go wrong is that uh, there's a misconception in both the minds of the public, as well as some of the less educated breeders, that when you breed two organisms together, the result is as if you threw it in a smoothie machine or a milkshake machine, and it just takes everything and combines it into one final thing that's a smooth mixture. It doesn't work that way at all with genetics. Think of it more like each parent has a, represents a jar of marbles of various colors, right? Now, if you had a pure breeding strain, think of that jar of marbles as all being black, okay? And you had another strain that was a pure strain that bred true, and that one had white marbles in that. And you were only allowed to pick five marbles from each jar and make a new individual. How would that turn out? Everyone would be identical, very uniform, five black, five white, right? Now, if you took that individual, one of those generation, and crossed two of them together, that's the F2 generation, what happens then? Now you've got jars that have both black and white, and you might get a random number of black and white from one and a random number of black and white from the other, and now you're trying to build an individual that only gets 10 marbles, but they're not half black and half white anymore. Now they're a mixture of any combination of eight blacks and two whites, one white, nine black, any one of those permutations starts to create a great variation in that generation. That's why the F2 generation is considered the one that's extremely variable, okay? And an F1 generation from two pure strains tends to be like 
this homogenous, the milkshake idea. And so people think like, oh, I'll just use weird names, like, because that's what the strains are named like nowadays. Strawberry shortcake crust with uh, chocolate fudge sundae, you know, with, uh, and then, the, you know, it's crossed to a banana kush or something. And, and people on the buyer side just have this imagination of like, oh, wow, that's going to all mix together and be one uniform thing. And every seed's going to grow into this milkshake of all those components. And it doesn't work that way at all. Instead, what you get are everything from short plants to long, tall plants and resinous plants and not resinous plants. But all these different combinations start coming out of that. So that's another thing that I'd really love to get up on the soapbox as I am right now and say to people, like, remember, it doesn't work like a milkshake. <laughs> remember that. So two polyhybrids are going to give you very unpredictable, very different results in each of the individuals. Gentlemen at the back. Uh, is SCS the same as oil silver? It is not. It's related. It has silver in the name. And uh, they're two different substances that work on the same principle. I've had great success with silver thiosulfate. I've only read about the colloidal silver as being a little overly aggressive for the job. Okay, and that, that was the one thing that uh, I had heard about colloidal silver. Some people also talk of gibberellic acid as being a way of reversing a uh, female, but I'm the kind of person where if it's not broke, I don't fix it. So the silver thiosulfate seems to work really well, and I'm not interested in it, you know, like, oh, let me try something else, you know. I always wonder about that when people say to me, like, hey, I've been running this particular nuke for 22 years, and uh, what do you think of this other thing? I'm thinking of making a change. And I was like, well, what's not working about what you're doing right now that you would want to change it, you know? And um, it's, uh, please. Um, in your experience, does resin content correlate to cannabinoid content? Cannabinoid profile is a combination of uh, various quantities of proportions of the various cannabinoids that are produced by any one individual plant. And uh, potency is the THC, right? That's what gets you high. So you're only focusing on one cannabinoid when you're talking about potency, but the character of the high is changed by all those various cannabinoids coming together in a cocktail that affects you like differently depending on their proportions in the package, right? So you have your indica plants that tend to make you sleepy, right? That's because of the cannabinoid profile having an emphasis on a sleepy drug effect, and the uh, sativas tend to have the energizing uplifting cerebral high that comes from possibly more THCV or these types of things. So, yeah, that changes the character of the high and the potency, the effect that you feel can be greatly in. You can have a lower THC number and feel like that pot, pot is more potent than one that has a higher THC number, depending on the cannabinoid profile. So the answer is kind of yes. Okay. Anybody else before we close? I think Danny Danko is about to start. I just got to yes, sir, lady. Because the, the indica and the sativa affect me differently. Absolutely. The indica, no, the indica makes me uh, not sleepy. Okay. The sativa makes me sleepy. Huh. See a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. No, you're special. Okay. I don't know. Most people, that, it depends too. Like, how do you know how indica your indica is? Oh, I know. Okay. okay. Last month, I have things that are. As long as you know, it sounds like, uh, yeah, you're just reacting. Everybody's different, right? Any more quick ones before Danny jumps in? Yes, sir. How do you feel? Do you have any advice for aspiring readers on this, on this coast, on the East Coast? Uh -huh. Use your work and say these are like F two or F three. Right. Use it in the boss. Uh, is, that, is that acceptable? Is there guidelines? I like I like that question because when I sell you a pack of seeds, what control do I have over what you're going to do with them? Very little, right? Now I know breeders who will say like you know. I don't like it if somebody takes my seeds and they cross it with something else and now they're going to sell seeds and you know they started a whole seed business off of my back. Well, if you feel that way about your strain, why are you selling it and giving it to people to do that with, right? Don't let the horse out of the barn. If I sell you a pack of seeds, I've already thought that through very carefully and I've said, no matter what anybody does with these seeds, I don't care. It's your seeds. They're your plants now. They're not mine anymore. So whatever you want to do with anything you buy from us, 
It's up to you. You would not be stepping on our toes at all. It's a compliment, really. And being Brothers Grimm, we have a reputation that's very solid and, uh, and very uh, strong that would add to the value of what you're selling if you actually mentioned us. So we're kind of unique in that sense that like, if it's a smaller breeder who nobody's ever heard of and somebody gets his genetics and starts playing with them and creates his own seed company, the other guy can kind of feel miffed, you know, like, hey, you know, you didn't even mention you got it from me, and it's like, well, why should I? Nobody's ever heard of you anyway. Whereas if you say, well, this is from original Brothers Grimm genetics, and then I've done this with it, that's going to add to your import, right? It's going to make it a more valuable product. I'm going to have to close out. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thanks very much. You come to see us at booth 426. Thanks for filming.